Western Science Festival, now we have Oxford, Edinburgh, so many, dozens, and the general public go along and some fabulous things are done at the Science Festival. There are conferences laid on for a public, for the public, for the ordinary person to go in and be a member of the audience by organizations like Demos and the Royal Society. And groups like the National Farmers Union, the National Trust, the Women's Institutes, they like to have serious conferences where scientists come along to talk about things that they want to know about, climate change, the scientific truth, stem cells, what's happening, all sorts of medical science they're interested in. And there are new television and radio science programs. There's been a big campaign to get more science on television and radio. Newspapers are doing more with science. I get The Guardian and The Times every day, and each of them will have at least half a dozen scientific stories inside them. And it's the same with many newspapers now. And science books sell incredibly well. Fortunately, last, my last one sold over a million copies, so I'm smiling at the moment about that. And we are always on the lookout for new scientists who can go out and talk to the public and can go out and be on television. And the situation is getting easier for scientists. In the, men, in the past, a lot of scientists I knew were actually ostracized by fellow academics. The first one was David Bellamy, who taught me botany at Durham University. And my husband, who works in television, was the first person in local BBC television to put him on the screen. And he was seen and picked up for a botany series. But he obviously was not spending as much time at university. They were cross. Some were very jealous, didn't think academics should be doing this. He was ostracized and lost his chair. And Lord Robert Winston, he ran a brilliant IVF clinic, an NHS IVF clinic at one of the London hospitals for many years. Then 10 years ago, when he was quite an old man and certainly not a glamorous figure, he was asked to present a BBC series called The Human Body. And it was watched by millions of people. And he's presented other series since. And he said to me, even at that stage in my career, when I was retiring from IVF, I was ostracized by other academics for going on the television. And just think how much science he's brought across to people by doing that. Now it's happening all over again. A much younger man you may have seen recently, Professor Brian Cox, who's professor of physics at Manchester. And he's been telling you all on television about the mysteries of the universe. He's been describing the Large Hadron Collider at Geneva. And a new BBC series is being prepared as we speak. But he said it was only because he got a fellowship, a grant from the Royal Society, to do his research as a very young scientist that he had the courage to carry on and do this because other academics were so grim about it. And it was only because he had that funding from the Royal Society, he felt he could carry on. So it's, it's bad. But now the attitude has changed. We've got people like Marcus de Sortoy doing an awful lot on television and newspapers about maths. Professor Jim Al-Khalili doing lots of physics. Professor Steve Jones with his series on genetics and writing regularly on the science page of the Daily Telegraph. And Professor Kathy Sykes, who you may have seen on television doing a series doing a series on alternative medicine, does it really work, what's the science of it, who's at Bristol University. And this year, as I'm sure you all know, it's the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth and the 50th anniversary of C.P. Snow's lecture, The Two Cultures, about the breakdown in communication between the sciences and the humanities. And this year in particular, everybody's looking for more science and more scientists to go out and communicate with the public. So, do any of you fancy becoming a celebrity scientist? I'll give you a few warnings. As somebody who did get pretty well known after 20 years on Tomorrow's World, you have to cope with adoration. <laughs> For example, I used to always rush into the supermarket as soon as it opened on Saturday morning, without having a wash, without breakfast, throw on an old tracksuit to get the shopping done, when there was nobody in the supermarket. And one day, this 14-year-old boy, looked about 14 anyway, was nudging his mother 
And I liked what he said. There were a lot of fans of that age in, the, in those days. I liked what he said. I think that's the girl on Tomorrow's World. <laughs> <laughs> and his mother just looked me up and down and said, no, it can't be because she's such a slut. <laughs> And if you do live television, and live television is very exciting, you have to cope with new technology. And those of you, everybody in the audience who said you can watch Tomorrow's World, would have seen us get it wrong time and time again, because things didn't work, as we saw with the DVD. If you're using technology and bits of equipment, something can go wrong. And we were having a laugh in the BBC canteen. We used to be along the corridor from BBC Sport. We were having a laugh about a particularly disastrous Tomorrow's World the night before. And Des Lyman said, that's nothing to what happened in sport, because sport's live, as you know, and things can go wrong with their technology. But this was something that happened a long time ago, and it was the first time sport ever used, or television ever used video disc. That's action replay. You know, we rely on it for all sports now. You see the goals again action replay or video disc it's called. Now the first time it was used it was a cricket match and Dennis Compton was the commentator. Now afterwards people said well there might have been a bit of double confusion there, partly the new technology but partly the hospitality tent. <laughs> but it was good cricket apparently and Benno was bowling to Edridge and it was a googly that was misread by Edridge who was bowled. My husband used to play cricket so I know all of this. <laughs> The producer, they always talk to you through an earpiece. You always wear an earpiece when you're doing live television. The producer said, Dennis, talk us through it, please. So Dennis, in his normal style, which I can't imitate, said, well, Benno fooled Edrich there. Edrich played for the orthodox ball, and it was a googly. And the producer, so proud to be using action replay for the first time, said, hit disc. And Dennis looked at the screen, double confusion. And he said to all the viewers, by Christ, Benno's done it again. <laughs> <laughs> you have to cope with being recognized. Now, my sons used to hate it when they were out with me, when they were little, you know, little boys get very embarrassed. But we were on holiday for the first time in America with them, and they said, this is great, Mum, because tomorrow's world wasn't shown in America. Nobody recognized me. And then, sure enough, out of the pub, in a place in California came some very drunk group of English people. And from quite a distance, they were shouting, we know who you are, and they weaved their way across. And they were so drunk, they actually prodded me in the shoulder, said, you can't deny it. We know who you are. You're Miriam Stoppard. <laughs> <laughs> so the rest of the holiday, I was Miriam to everybody else. But I think it's been easy for me compared to some. A friend of mine told me a true story. Recently, she was in a butcher's shop near Sandringham, and she saw an old lady looking at the meat in a corner, and she had one of those silk scarves tied under her chin and gray curls coming out, and she just couldn't resist going over her, to her, and she said, do you know, you look just like the queen. And this person said, how frightfully reassuring. <laughs>